So we're going to talk about how to jam nonlinear specifications into a linear regression. And we call that a nonlinear regression. We do this because, you know, as you've probably figured out, economists are kind of good at using, you know, wringing every last drop of juice out of any good idea. Good ideas are rare, and we got to, yeah, squeeze every everything we can out of those. So, you know, linear regressions are one of those rare good ideas that we want to get a lot of use out of. So how do we do that? Well, you know, we can sort of think at a first step that, well, actually nonlinear models are kind of more generically how the world works. And, you know, a linear model is often a simplification or an admission that, well, we don't actually know that much. You know, it's a very like a first order kind of guess. You know, if, if you remember um, from calculus or I don't know, maybe you did this in analysis or something, any differentiable function can be approximated within a neighborhood by a linear function, right? That's basically the Taylor theorem from calculus. Um, and, you know, so again, not every function of the world is going to be differentiable. Um, certainly if you do finance, there are lots of, you know, uh, variables with non-differentiable paths. But again, for a, a variety of cases, we're going to say, all right, I'm, I'm feeling okay with saying, okay, the, the relation should be at least differentiable and continuous. Um, you know, so I maybe can try some higher order specifications. And, you know, again, out of the Taylor theorem, you know, the, the idea of higher order polynomials uh, sort of spills right out as, at, again, at least within a neighborhood, those are going to be a reasonable kind of extension. Um, and so how do we use a linear regression to use to with a nonlinear term? Well, you know, ordinarily we could do a, a multivariate regression. Y is beta naught plus beta 1x1 plus beta 2x2. But what if for x2 I just move that 2 up? And so it's called x2 equal to x squared, um, or log x, or something like that. And the answer is, yeah, it works fine. You know, it goes right on through. So, you know, if I have regress wage on beta naught plus beta 1 age plus beta 2 age squared, plus maybe some other stuff, plus my error term, you know, then I, if, now again, remember your calculus class, how do I find d wage d age? Well, you take the derivative with respect to age, that's going to be beta 1 plus beta 2 times 2 times age, right? That's the, the first derivative of that parabola, um, right? And so that's allowing as people's age increases, their wage can go up at first, but then sort of gradually uh, the sort of wage increase on your birthday starts to get smaller and smaller. Eventually you're over the hill is the phrase. You know, you stop getting a raise and maybe you actually start declining. Um, now again, we can debate about, you know, how useful this is, or you can go out and estimate in the world, okay, how useful is this? It actually gets used in a whole variety of different cases. Um, if you looked at like sports statistics or something, this is often, you know, people's uh, productivity is measured by some sort of, uh, you know, Y variable there is maybe, you know, a function of their age. And, you know, most people, okay, maybe not Tom Brady, but a lot of people, you know, reach and start getting over the hill. Um, you know, so how do we find where is the over-the-hill point? Well, again, like I said, from calculus, I know the slope is going to be beta 1 plus 2 beta 2 age. So set that equal to 0, because I know at the uh, local maximum or local minimum, you know, I've got to check which one it is. Um, but at least the way I've drawn it this time, it's the local maximum. So the slope is going to be equal to 0. So find where that is. Um, you know, so just a little bit of calculus knowledge and you can find exactly where do I estimate is the peak of this wage age curve. And, you know, you can add 
x cubed, you can add x fourth, you can add, you know, higher order polynomial terms as much as you want because, you know, whatever, just at a certain point try to go crazy. Now, you know, there's, if you read the literature, there are debates about how many higher order terms do you really want. You know, there's kind of a limit. I mean, there are people who will go to the mat for h cubed and h to the fourth. You don't usually ever see anything beyond that. Um, you know, again, later on, maybe we'll talk about some alternative specifications or ways of kind of giving even more flexibility. Um, you know, but you can, like I said, you, you can make a case, but more specifically, you can do statistical tests. If I have h, h squared, h cubed, h to the fourth, I can test, well, are those higher order polynomial terms or are the coefficients on those higher order polynomial terms jointly equal to zero? That's one of those, uh, you know, hypothesis tests that we we're talking about. Of, you know, I want to test are all of those coefficients statistically different from zero? You generally do not want to go through and say, well, the one in h squared is statistically different from zero. The one in h fourth is different from zero, but cubed now, yeah, oh God, that's not different from zero. Just drop that from the regression, right? Because it's kind of weird to think you'd have uh, such precise knowledge about one of those polynomial terms and not any of the others. But, you know, so that, that's kind of weird. Um, but you can certainly test them jointly. Um, and, you know, even adding in the age linear term, you can test for does age in with all of its powers have any relationship to wage. And so just as we put in squared cube or higher order polynomial terms, we can also put in logs. Now that we're not in elementary school, log here means the natural log, i.e. the base e, because that's what makes sense. So, you know, you could specify, you could take the log of x, you could take the log of y, you could do both. Um, now again, got to remember uh, Jensen's inequality means the mean of the log of y is not the same as the log of the mean of y, you know, because it's a, a complex function there. Um, so, you know, you got to remember which one you're doing and make the appropriate adjustments. One of the reasons we we economists always use logs, and like hopefully you've seen this since your 100 level classes, is because from calculus, logs have an easy interpretation. If I have, you know, whatever the, the log of w is, then what is the derivative of that? Well, the derivative is the percent change, right? Because the derivative of the natural log is gonna be dw divided by w. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's the percent change. Um, so if I have log x as my variable in the regression instead of x, then, you know, now I can interpret that coefficient, that beta, as the change in y from a 1% change in x. Which, you know, again, depending on your specification, that might make a little bit more sense. Um, Opposite, I could do log y, and now, you know, the beta would instead be sort of the percent change in y from a one unit change in x. And, you know, so again, maybe the, the age-wage profile does a better job talking about it, you know, in that way, that, you know, on your wage, on your birthday, instead of getting a wage increase of a certain number of dollars, you get a wage increase of a certain percent of your wage. I mean, you know, again, it... it it's not necessarily obvious if you just like think about it, you know. I mean, it's, you know, more a case of, well, just go to the data and try it out. Um, you know, moderated perhaps by, you know, see what is commonly done by other people kind of looking at similar questions. Um, and um, again, I skipped over one. I said, we could also do log x and log y. In that case, the beta coefficient there would be the elasticity, right? That's the percent change in y that is uh, driven by a percent change in x. And again, you know how economists love us some elasticities, so you can bet you're going to see those kind of specifications reasonably often.